Uh, thank you for coming. Um, as I remind my students at the high school, sorry, my name is Jason Barney, uh, member of the Historical Society Board. Uh, if everyone wants to check their cell phones to make sure that their cell phones are off, uh, that would just be great. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, teaching at MBU, um, I'm one of the history teachers there, and being on the Historical Society Board, my mind works very chronologically, and I enjoy the idea of having, having programs that are anniversary dates. So when we were talking about uh, what would be a good program for 2017, we decided to ask Fred Wiseman to come in and talk about everything that he has accumulated about the history of the Robin Hood plant uh, here in Swanton and its relation to World War I. It's probably appropriate to recognize the current owner of the building, Mr. Foskate. Thank you for coming. Thank all of you for coming. Uh, there are refreshments and um, cookies over here uh, uh, for after the presentation or for Thursday during the presentation. But uh, you guys are here to hear Fred. So, Mr. Wiseman, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, when I I wrote uh, when I started making this uh, this presentation, uh, I was writing doing it kind of along the lines of uh, a history. Uh, then I saw that uh, t in order to bring the public in, we had to make it uh, a little bit more explosive. Okay, so you notice that. So uh, I went back and uh, redid my PowerPoint a little bit, and I've got some uh, sound effects and things like that uh, to help with, uh, with that to liven it up. So let's get started. Um, the first thing I think that we could talk about is that Swanton uh, years ago was a very much of a hunting and fishing town. Uh, everybody in town uh, had guns and fishing rods and things like that. So uh, this is my grandfather right here. Uh, he was a foreman at the Robin Hood. And this is Mr. Bradley. He was an executive. Uh, they're out woodchuck hunting in full suits and tie, OK, uh, with press collars. Could you imagine going, uh, going out deer hunting like that today? Uh, and these uh, these two rifles still exist uh, in town. Now, one is a uh, Remington rolling block, and the other is a Ballard 3A. Now, this is what Swanton looked like in those days. Um, this is a shot, uh, basically more or less just down from my house on Spring Street, uh, looking down uh, Canada. Does anybody know where that's that this little fountain is today? It's in the Riverside Cemetery. Okay, this used to be a functional uh, fountain, and my there's uh, interesting stories about uh, how that was actually uh, moved. But that's another another story. But <clears throat> does anybody have any idea of why the Robin Hood name was given to the Robin Hood, the Prince of Thieves? Uh, as somebody that takes for the rich and powerful and gives to the poor? Well, it was specifically, and I didn't find this out until just fairly recently, um, it's based on uh, a conglomerate that tried to get a monopoly on all firearm cartridge production. Uh, it is called the Ammunition Manufacturers of America Association. It was formed in 1883. And it consisted of Union uh, Remington Arms, Winchester, and three other uh, corporations. They banded together uh, to control the uh, components of cartridges. Okay, the brass, uh, the what's called fulminate of mercury, uh, and the chlorate of potash. Okay, so they were the ones that controlled all of that. And the idea was to eliminate competition. And so what they did is they set up this economic boycott uh, to prevent anybody else from uh, being able to rise up. And so in 1898, uh, the, a group of Americans and Canadians, uh, Robin was, was originally uh, half Canadian in terms of its board of directors. Uh, they got together to form uh, the Robin Hood Powder Company. They built this structure right here. Uh, it's called the Powder Horn. And this was the whole uh, original whole Robin Hood uh, powder company. Uh, you'll see that there's this big, uh, this big belt 
It goes way out here. Lots of interesting stories. This ground, uh, some of the materials, uh, and they had to keep everything far apart because everything would tend to blow up. Okay? And so the pow it had one boiler in there uh, to go into one of the buildings that ground up some of the, uh, the material. The interesting thing is when they set this up, they couldn't get any equipment. They were not able to buy any uh, loaders. They could make the bowder. Okay, because uh, that is just a matter of chemistry. Okay, you can get that from anywhere. But uh, if you wanted to make something other than gunpowder, you'd have to uh, buy things to actually shape uh, the cartridges. And these, uh, these are big types of punch presses uh, that are uh, quite complex, and they could not buy any in the United States because of this conglomerate. So they ended up having to uh, ship the equipment from England and then take it down the Richelieu River and get it to Swanton before uh, <laughs> Remington and Winchester and everybody else discovered it. Okay? Uh, so that's where the idea of Robin Hood came from, is that Robin Hood was taking from the big uh, cartridge uh, manufacturers conglomerate uh, and setting up their own operation. So there's a little bit of interesting history for you. Uh, the next thing they uh, they had to try to um, to get was the material to make primers, and that was also controlled by the uh, the conglomerate as well. But they were able to get uh, primer making materials. Now there's Four components. Two of them are, we have to think about, okay? One of them is called fulminative mercury. Fulminative mercury uh, and chlorate of potash. These two have to be mixed in very specific ways and handled in very specific uh, ways or it goes kaboom. And uh, so we're going to talk about some of those kabooms. But the thing is that everybody else in the United States was a member of this conglomerate. Uh, they could get fulminative mercury that was uh, put together in the big factories that had the equipment for quality control, but none of the little guys like this. So Robin Hood uh, had to make its own, okay? And so it ordered the uh, fulminate. It came uh, from England uh, on sailing ships, can you imagine that, uh, in a big barrel, uh, in a bag inside suspended with ropes. Okay, so uh, for the first few years here, uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, there's this uh, very important Canadian connection uh, that, uh, that we see in the first few years. And that's because the uh, American cartridge companies wouldn't let, uh, let them do anything. Uh, let's see, I guess that's... This is an example of one of their first uh, shotgun shells. This is a Robin Hood number 12. Uh, this one here, uh, the casing and the primer is made in England. Okay, to Robin Hood specs. Shipped over and then they loaded it with Robin Hood powder that was made at the, uh, at the powder horn. So that's the earliest uh, variety that we have. It has a, uh, a kind of a dark purplish uh, shell casing. I've got examples of these he over here. In 1900, uh, they moved and built a new structure right on the side of the Missisquoi where Smitty's uh, starter uh, was right here. So, uh, of course, this doesn't exist anymore, and I'll tell you why a little bit later. Okay. Um, so it was, this was quite a modern factory. You notice it, uh, it had cell stories and all kinds of things on it, the uh, overhead Things to let light in. Um, this is a picture my granddad took. Uh, this is his bicycle here, okay, at the Robin Hood. So uh, that's, this is a side um, facing to the west. The river would be over on this side. But you can see there's, uh, it's kind of fancy for those days. Look at there, the number of panes and muntins in the, uh, in the windows there. Everything's double pa uh two color uh, painted and things like that, so fancy.
Wish I had that bicycle, it would be highly collectible. <laughs> this is the inside uh, of it. This here is, uh, this is my grandfather's desk. This is where he worked. He was in charge of, uh, of the machine uh, shop that made all the cartridge uh, press dies and stuff like that. I'm just gonna slide this a little bit because it's a kind of okay. a view. Yeah, sorry. Okay, over here, these are those uh, cartridge loading presses that had to be imported from England, okay? So uh, these are the ones that stamped out the, uh, all the cartridges. Then they were taken over to the powder horn and loaded over there. Uh, then they were brought back and then the, uh, the bullets were put into the cartridge case at, this, uh, at the factory here. So it was a very long drawn out process. Now the early Robin Hood products was mostly black and smokeless powder. Now smokeless powder was a brand new thing uh, in the early part of the 20th century. And what, they, what Robin Hood wanted to do, the first thing they wanted to do, is they wanted to uh, produce uh, smokeless powder for people to hand load. Now hand loading is, instead of buying a cartridge already put together, a cartridge consists of, you know, the bullet itself, the cartridge case, uh, the primer that fires it off, and then the powder that's on the inside. Okay. Uh, but around the turn of the century, most people that did a lot of hunting uh, reloaded their own cartridges. But uh, everybody was used to measuring the, the uh, powder out by what's called bulk, okay, by its volume rather than its weight. And so smokeless powder is a lot denser than, uh, than black powder. And it actually explodes in a slightly different way. I'm not going to get into the weeds on that. But needless to say that somebody that's used to loading with uh, black powder, which had been around basically, you know, forever, um, if they accidentally thought that they could, let's say, uh, load a 3240, which uh, the 32 is the caliber, the 40 is the grains of powder that's in it. If they put 40 grains of smokeless powder in that, the whole gun would blow up and kill the person. So there's a lot of problems with, with this. So uh, they had to um, buy black powder from DuPont. Okay, and they sold that, but they made their own smokeless powder. And I'm going to talk about some of their solutions to this problem, okay, a little bit later. Well, if anybody has any questions, just raise your hand and I'll be glad to go off on the appropriate tangent, okay? <laughs> so this is an example of, uh, of an early Robin Hood powder can. Uh, it's exactly the same as the Robin Hood later one, but you look down here and it says Robin Hood Powder Company. Okay, later says ammunition on it. Now, unfortunately, the lacquer that they put on this uh, actually shrinks a lot more than the paint, and so it all gets this nice antique crackel kind of uh, design on it, which just really messes up its uh, collector's value. But here's one that was uh, was printed. This is the large Robin Hood Powder Company can, and we have one over here. And I've got a great story about these things. Okay. So this is a powder can. Uh, back in the 1960s, I was really interested in history and stuff like that. And I hung around with an interesting character uh, named Oren Batchelder, who was a, uh, a friend of my dad's. And so he kind of took me under his wing a little. What, a lot of people remember Oren? Good. Uh, he took me under his wing. We used to um, go exploring. I shouldn't say this now that the owner is there, but uh, uh, or, uh, those of you that remember Oren, was, he was kind of an interesting character, so we decided to break in to one of the rooms in the Robin Hood that was sealed up. Um, and so we did, and we found these things stacked in a corner. I swear to God, I was just a kid, okay, from here over to there. Probably 150, 250 of them. They were all empty, not a single one was full, and not a single one had this. I got two. And Oren said, there, there, Fred. Okay, there, are you happy? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I went away. Uh, but these are all over the United States now. Uh, some of them still have their wrappers. 
Okay, I've got one with this wrapper on it. See, there's the remains of the wrapper. So Orin, I don't know what happened to the rest of them, but I, uh, you know, I think that Orin uh, hit a real jackpot in these things because, uh, you know, when they first start, these uh, generally would go between sixty and one hundred fifty dollars, depending on their shape. Uh, each, so that was quite a windfall. So. What is the hole in the bottom? That's where that's where you load it, you load the powder in. Oh. That's where you unscrew it. You've seen the uh, all the uh, western savages where they do this. Yeah, they and they light, light, and light and boom. Okay, that's uh, this is the remains of an old keg, uh, wooden powder keg type style. So, Brad, let's give Orrin the benefit of the doubt and assume that he left the rest of them right there. Uh, they weren't back there the year after. I I went back for them. <laughs> So, now I, I don't know, you know, Oren never, uh, never said, but that's an interesting story. You know, you, there's uh, lots of other interesting stories about Oren, but, uh, and another interesting character, Ben Gravel. Okay, Ben also worked at the Robin Hood, so I did some exploring uh, around uh, at the Ro Robin Hood with, uh, with Ben. There's a couple interesting stories there, but I don't have all that time. But a lot of interesting people back in the uh, 50s and 60s here. Now, um, about 1905, let's get into the shot show manufacturers uh, a little bit. I don't want to get in the weeds too far, but uh, they basically used uh, several types of powder. Okay, they're peerless smokeless powder that they used in Clipper and Capital. Uh, this type of uh, of powder was the gunpowder that you do not want to hand load. Okay, uh, that is a type of gunpowder that uh, is uh, is very very condensed. Um, even more dense is rapidite. Okay, uh, this one here is uh, is used was used at this time for military cartridges. It's what we call a ball, early type of a ball powder. Uh, this is the one, the Comet, okay, uh, used what we call Robin Hood bulk. This is the earliest type, Robin Hood bulk. is mixed with some other things. Uh, so it makes it a lot more, uh, I guess, bulky, I guess you could say. So you can hand load it by uh, by its uh, volume rather than its density. And so here's some examples of the uh, Robin Hood powder. This is the Robin Hood. This is the earliest, one of the earliest types of boxes that we have. Okay, Robin Hood Powder Company. This is the type, remember I told you that was imported from England. This is the one that got around uh, the cartridge uh, conglomerates, uh, boycott or blockade or whatever you want to call it. I apologize for the graphics here. This uh, this version here doesn't accept my fancy graphics I uh, I used in it. So in 1906, uh, they were selling so much that um, they decided to reincorporate. Uh, there are some changes in the uh, the ownership uh, and the leadership and things like that, and they decided to start uh, branching out from shotgun shells into metallic cartridges like 22s and, uh, and center fire and stuff like that. So kind of the heyday of Robin Hood uh, was 1906 to uh, 1916, 1915, excuse me. So once again, this is, uh, this is where the Robin Hood was here. And uh, as, um, well, oh, well, just getting back to Oren uh, Batchelor, uh, these, the typing that he did right on these these pictures here has been an absolute godsend for historians. I've used uh, his data uh, over and over again from everything from uh, things on Abenaki uh, to the Robin Hood because he collected large numbers of these pictures and actually some of them he got from my uh, my father and grandfather. Uh, but then very carefully with an old rimfire typewriter he put the uh, the data on it. Uh, so it would never, ever get separated. And so that's, that's the kind of work that we really need to have historians do is we 
keep the data together with a picture. How many of you have an old album, right? And you don't know who the heck it is, you don't know what that building is, is that the other thing? Okay, well, Oren was, um, I, I, I don't think he had a single one that wasn't uh, annotated. Do you, are you? Not too many. I know, it's amazing the work that that guy did. Yep. <laughs> yep. So uh, this is all, you know, it, and of course, you can uh, you can Photoshop it out, but I have no interest in doing that because this is commemorates some really important uh, important data, and a and a man too. But back to the information here. So this is what they did in the early days. Shotgun shells, yeah, yeah, yeah. They continued with that, but then they started getting into uh, rimfire. Uh, 22 caliber rimfire, and my grandfather uh, made the die to stamp the R on all of the uh, Robin Hood rimfires, and there it is right there. Okay, uh, so I guess I could actually fake up some, uh, you know, original Robin Hoods. But the thing is, would it not be would it be original or not if it uses the original die? So. Interesting puzzle, but uh, just the, uh, to actually look at the exquisite work on the engraving uh, that was done on this thing. It's just amazing to see the, uh, the effort uh, that went in. And th th these were all handmade. All these dies were hand engraved and hand shaped uh, to, you know, within two one thousandths of an inch. And me, I try to carve and I can't, I can't even get close to that. But then in 1909, they had so much uh, activity, sales, they became very popular, uh, especially out west. And I have an interesting uh, thing that I purchased a few years ago. Yeah, here it is. This is a, uh, a Robin Hood price list uh, from a distributor in Kansas City for selling the, uh, all these out west. And it's really amazing to, uh, so I brought that in so you can, these are all original uh, documents here. So that's kind of fascinating uh, to see that Robin Hood uh, was a huge deal uh, out in Wyoming and stuff. And actually people that collect Robin Hood uh, find a lot of these out west, which, so it wasn't a strictly east coast deal at all. Fred, yes, sir. In that image? So are there three sets of tracks that wrap around the Oh, um, no, there's actually two. This is one set of tracks. This was from the uh, St. J and Elsie, the St. Jesus and Long Coming. Okay, this was for the power. Yeah. So coal came in here. This one, this is uh, the one that brought in supplies and then took things out. Uh, and this was, I guess this is the one that went to jo or John's Bridge. So it'd be interesting to, to uh, you know, try to see how much of these remain today. This is a, uh, a sketch that I did in 1969 uh, with a walkthrough with, uh, with my father, Oren Bachelor, and uh, um, Ben Gravel. And so you can see we scratched things out. People agreed and disagreed at it. And so uh, this is kind of what it looked like and what people remember in the uh, Robin Hood era. But you'll notice occasionally headers. Now these are the things that stamp the, uh, the bottom of a cartridge. This says Remington here. Remington loading shells. So we had um, Ben worked at the, um, at the Robin Hood. Oh, there's a Mr. Gagne too. Uh, I can't remember his. Uh, and he worked for my grandfather in the Remington. And so we had everybody out there uh, looking at things and remembering. So I was able to uh, you know, get this, this map uh, worked up. My grandfather's uh, office was right this whole area here. That was, that was his. So every now and then I like to go over and just look at where my granddad uh, did, his, did his livelihood. Oh yes, okay. Um, this reminds me to read you a story. Uh, this gentleman here, this is my dad, uh, this is Bill Borden, and this is Judson Hilliker. He's the guy that founded Hilliker uh, band lines that then um, uh, 
went to and became McClure, okay? McClure uh, lines. So a story uh, uh, from Judd. So this is about 1911, and so I'm going to read from my book uh, or my article that I did a few years ago. And to liven things up a little bit, here is a, uh, a noisemaker uh, to bring some life. This is called a matraca. It's used uh, in New Mexico by the penitentes and uh, in Mexico by people that announce the Pharisees. It is the loudest, most aggravating, and annoying uh, thing that I can think of. So here. So there we go. Might be a machine gun. Okay. Don't you just love it? Fulminate made it the, at the Robin Hood specifications. Was shipped it to Swanton by rail uh, in cloth bags supported by four ropes. In the fulminate rooms, the mixture was kept moist in an open container, then formed into round pellets. These tiny wet pellets were taken to the vacuum dryer. Um, I'll show you the vacuum dryer later. Uh, where the water was driven off. Um, the finished pellets were taken to the primer house, a wooden building directly south of the powder plant. Here the primer cup pellet of, of fulminate, foil and anvil were combined to form the Robin Hood, uh, five Robin Hood varieties of primers, and I'm not going to get tell you what they are. That's kind of boring. Uh, the finished primers were then went to the priming presses in the main building. Working in the primer manufacturing areas was about as dangerous a job as can be imagined. Swanton still recalls the many explosions, detonations, and fires that emanated from the southern part of Robin Hood's ground. Judson Hilliker, once a Robin Hood employee, describes the total annihilation of a fulminate room. I was in the fulminate building on business connected with primer testing. The fulminate was kept wet, sort of the consistency of paste in an open container. I noticed that the fulminate was working, sort of moving about in the container. This is a sign the fulminate is becoming unstable and has but little time before it explodes. When this happens, get out. Don't try to wet it down, but get out. I shot out of the workmen to move and ran out of the door. Suddenly it felt like a huge hand picked me up and threw me several yards forward. I was unhurt until the shock set in that night. The alarms and whistles started going. Captain Bradley, the general manager, came running out and asked, I what, asked how I was. I was okay, but the fulminate room was only a hole in the ground behind me. So saith Judd Hilliker. So, is that a, that's a good explosion story, isn't it? Oops, wrong way. I don't want to exit the presentation. All right, can somebody that knows the machine give me a hand? Yeah. Is there... So I've got to get this back up. Can, you want to go to slide slideshow slide up show, here, up in the right? left, yeah. left corner, way up here. Oh wait a minute. Oh okay. Yeah. Slideshow. Yeah, get I'm getting slide? there. There you go. Okay, start. I'm going to try to start from the. I can't get down. Yeah, thing is slow. It's very slow. All right, let's try that again. I apologize. I should have brought my uh, my remote. Did you get to enjoy these all again. Okay, so that's what I wanted to show you. There's a fulminate room after the explosion. <laughs> That one there, I believe, was at the um, at the powder horn. Mm. So, these are this is kind of the heyday of the Robin Hood. What they they made probably about 1910. So they made uh, 10, 12, uh, 16, and 20 gauge shotgun shells, and uh, basically what's called high and low brass. 
Uh, anybody that does a lot of duck hunting knows that uh, you can have low brass. This is, uh, doesn't use anywhere near as much powder. And it, so this is good for upland hunting. This is for things like, uh, like rough grouse, okay? But it's also the same material, um, the same powder can be put in what's called a high brass. Base. See how high the brass is? Yeah, that's called low brass, high brass, okay? Uh, this one here is what you use for ducks and stuff like that. That would fire at a, um, at a much higher pressure and shoot out a lot farther. This is really fascinating. That's an original, and it looks just like a Xerox. I don't know exactly how they um, how they printed that out to make it. You know, it looks exactly like a 1970s Xerox machine. No, I don't want the end. I want page. Okay, let's try that again. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, you're seeing all the stuff I was going to get to yeah, now. No surprise. <laughs> no surprise. Ah, technology. Don't you just love it? Okay, let's see. Where am I? Getting close. Okay, so here we are at the shotgun shells. And... These are some examples of, uh, of cartridge uh, boxes. You can see once again, the, the, uh, a lot of them actually had beautiful uh, early lithography and stuff. Here's Robin Hood up here in uh, six colors. This is a pretty expensive thing to, uh, to lithograph here. So he was the icon or the trademark yes. of their products and appeared on most of the packaging? On every, just about everything, yep. So there, there it is again with, uh, that's, the clipper shells, so there he is, with uh, some spruce or wheat on the sides, I'm not quite sure. There's the clips, there's old Robin Hood again. Near smokeless. Yep. Uh, the DuPont made a, uh, a black powder that actually had a slightly different combination, uh, and it was called Lesmok, L-E-S-M-O-K. And uh, Robin Hood reverse engineered it and came up with, when you can't just mix black and smokeless powder together to make semi-smokeless, it has to be a different different uh, chemical route. So that's kind of interesting thing. So here's one of the um, heads of uh, the eclipse with Robin Hood. But notice the arrows? That's a little bit of detail. My grandfather uh, did all of this artwork. Do they tell you to do something? Go in this direction for something? No, it's just uh, Robin Hood's Mark. arrows. Oh. Just to keep the, uh, keep the theme. And then uh, lots of these crates are knocking around. Uh, back in the 60s, they knocked around huge numbers in Swanton. Everybody had tons of them that they put everything in. Um, the, I have only seen maybe two at garage sales since the, the 1970s, but... Uh, they're really interesting pieces. They've, uh, they're in two color, uh, red and black. And there's all different shapes, all different sizes, and these are highly collectible now. But they take a lot of space to store. We get down to metallic cartridges. The, about 1910, this is all they had. They had uh, various types of, uh, of 22s. This is a 22 short, long, and long rifle. Okay? As well as... Uh, 32 and 38 Smith and Wesson pistol. So these are by far the most common uh, cartridges that you're going to see out there uh, and collect. So this is a 22 uh, box here in two color. Not made by a trust. See that? Okay. Very populist. Metallic cartridge, surefire. Hmm. Once again, there's the there's Robin Hood. There's a 32 caliber. Uh, my I got this from my grandfather. It's still, a, I got a whole box of them, not opened. So I went. Uh, I bought at a gun show one. that's outside the box, so you can look at it. 
I'll never open that box because that decreases the value of it, at least by 60%. But why have something if you can't open it? <laughs> right? It's like the Barbie dolls. You know, if you get, have one of the original 19, what is it, 66 or whatever, Barbie doll, just opening that case, you lose it. You know? But you can't play with it. That's one reason. You can't have your cake and eat it, too. Wrong way. Now, this is a fascinating thing. Uh, these that uh, only Robin Hood and one other company made. These are 32 caliber Smith & Wesson pistol shot cartridges with a, uh, a wooden holder for uh, a very fine shot. This was used for vermin. Uh, and so if you had chipmunks, you had squirrels, whatever, just load one of these into your pistol. Uh, and because the pistol uh, barrel was rifled, it would spread it way out. So if the, if the squirrel was there, 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 or there, boom, and you'd get it. <laughs> okay, just made a small crack. We've had trouble with, uh, with chipmunks lately, but I'm not gonna use that. First of all, it's probably illegal, and secondly, it's probably wastes a lot of money. So there's the side of it. You notice by about 1910, uh, we're starting to get kind of the 1920s-ish look to our typefaces and stuff like that, becoming more modern and less Victorian feeling. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, you know, you can trace the style on them. Uh, this was the next kind of level that they got, got into uh, for, they started making 4440s. This was the original Winchester 73 cartridge right here, but what Robin Hood really specialized in was a very lightweight variety using a round ball that's called the Game Getter. Okay? And this was a very important gun that was used by trappers um, all throughout Vermont. There's the Game Getter box. And there it is right there. There's a Marbles uh, Game Getter. It's a fascinating piece. Um, it had two barrels. It had a 4440 barrel here, and it had a 22 up here. So you could load those in. You notice it had a really nice uh, sight on it. So you could go out in the woods and anything from a deer down to a squirrel, you could shoot with it once. But in those days, you knew how to shoot. That's all it took. Uh, and it had a folding uh, stock, so this thing came up like that. Really incredible piece. And the Robin Hood was really uh, teamed up with uh, Marble uh, Manufacturing Company up in Gladstone to make all of the cartridges for these things. And so here's the game getter. This is the 1940s, uh, a much later. Uh, and eventually, so here's the round headed bullet, but uh, 22 long rifle. So you could put all the different long rifle shots up here. And then eventually, uh, by 1930s, it's after our time, they started making it with a 410 underneath. Um, and when I was younger, I had one of these with a 410, and that kicked like an absolute mule. Because it just has this tiny little, you know, the, the buttstock is only that wide. Just boom. <laughs> when it was loaded, Fred, how did you tell the weapon which of the two loads you wanted it to oh. fire? Um, this has a little switch on it, just up or down. Oh. Piece of cake. Big stuff or little stuff. Yep. Up, up goes, bing, down goes, boom. And of course, they still made huge amounts of smokeless powder. And that's. And so here's some of the later notice this can, exactly the same as that early one, but it says Robin Hood Ammunition Company on it now. By 1915, they were really moving. Uh, they had start, They had now had 38 um, uh, Winchester WCF as well as 44 Winchesters. Uh, they had uh, automatic Colts. Okay, blanks, shot cartridges, everything. So they were really moving. Uh, life was really good in Swanton. They were. They had uh, started with about 300. They were moving up to about four, four and a, uh, 450 people. Um, Things were popping in Swanton when this, uh, this was going. Uh, 
And then uh, they were developing right now a high powered cartridge line. This is an example of the 30 uh, 30 30 Winchester. These were this was the uh, the most powerful types of guns uh, that you could uh, were normally available for hunting uh, in the United States at the time. And so they were this is my grandfather's log book. He actually designed all of the punches and all of the dies that made all the cartridges and all the cartridge parts. Okay? And that's sitting right open right over there and open if you'd like to uh, see uh, see his work okay he was a guy that any piece of uh, a Robin Hood cartridge that you've uh, you've got was well uh, done on dies my granddaddy made but something was going on uh, elsewhere in the world uh, that started changing the whole thing World War one so that's what we're kind of trying to think about a little bit now. Of course, we all know that began in 1914, our Stu Ferdinand. Um, and there was Germany, Austria, Hungary, Bulgaria, and the Ottoman Empire against Great Britain, France, Russia, Italy, Romania. And I didn't know that. Japan was an ally in World War I and the U.S. Bit of trivia there. I just learned something that I didn't know for, in preparing for this, so it's good. There are no experts, they're just aging students. So the first effects of the Great War. This is a letter um, by um, Ed Funk here to, writing to everybody that basically all, your, uh, all the cartridges we're not going to make anymore. Uh, we're going to continue with uh, our shotgun shells uh, for the near future. Now, the reason for this, they talk about it, they can't get any of the materials. They can't get the brass, they can't get the, uh, uh, the material for making some of the gunpowder, all kinds of things. So they uh, are going to have to just stick with, um, car with um, shotgun shells. Now, this is a confusing thing. I'm not... I've got some references to this, interestingly enough, uh, from documents up in Canada, but not in the United States, that maybe uh, the United States government ordered uh, a bunch of uh, 22 short for the US military. This is their training rifle. It's a, based on a Winchester low wall here. Um, and so this was the gun that people, uh, that people before World War I trained with in the uh, in the military so they wouldn't be wasting a huge amount of uh, of high caliber uh, you know larger caliber weapons so it may I, I there's no record that I have okay I don't know maybe the historical society has some uh, whether this actually uh, came this is one of the big mysteries and also um, there's a possible order uh, for 30 out sixes now People say that these were ordered, but my granddad's book does not have them in it. And if anybody was going to make them in 1915, uh, it would have been my, my dad, my grandfather, would have been, uh, you know, done the design. It's not in here. So I've gotten into some uh, discussions with, uh, with collectors and experts on the Robin Hood to uh, try to work that out. And I consider, you know, that document there supersedes all rumors because we haven't found a single cartridge oh. of either of those yet. But there seems, seems to be some documentation. So it's a mystery. Fred, I like is the company too small to get government contracts? Oh, let's just wait and see. Oh. <laughs> let's just wait and see. Because... Uh, and this is leading up to it now. There's a French army in Paris. They've got, this is the model 1886 Lebel. Okay, it was a rifle uh, that was the standard arm of the French in the First World War. It's also used uh, by several other countries as well. And uh, it was called uh, the gun. These are all the different variations of it, except for the bottom one. This is a sporterized one. Let's not worry about that. But these are all the various varieties of the eight, uh, eight millimeter. It it's use, uses what we call a boxer primer. Uh, rather than a Berdan primer, we don't have to worry about that. But that was a very interesting thing because the French 
always use Berdan primers, Berdan, as opposed to Boxer, British. But this one here, they decided to make a change. And, oops, um, but this is the thing that really uh, changed warfare, the Hotchkiss. This is model 1914. Uh, this is a machine gun that used the eight millimeter. And there's a lot of interesting stories of the Robin Hood about this particular gun right here. So, to answer your question, uh, January 1914, uh, the Robin Hood had its first order for 50 million cartridges from the French. So here you had the Robin Hood, okay? Uh, and all of a sudden, they were actually inundated. They produced, they were able to uh, start getting these out very, very quickly. And look, in June, just what, six months later, uh, the French ordered another 50 million. 100 million cartridges in six months. Okay? And so uh, the Robin Hood had to completely, uh, you know, rethink who it was and where it was in the world. And so there's uh, a LaBelle cartridge, uh, stamp 3, 1916, underneath it with uh, RHA on it, Robin Hood. Ammunition. And so here's my, my granddad's design uh, for the French government cartridge. This is all of the, uh, all of the data uh, with all the different drawing that you had to do from. What you had to do is take an actual sheet of brass, stamp it through a whole series of these dies, okay, to reshape it so it would end up being in the shape of a cartridge. And so he did all the design work uh, to set it up, and then they started producing them. Question. Yes. Sorry. I keep thinking that Robin Hood was still relatively small compared to all the big guys that didn't want them to get any supplies. So I'd like to know how the French government ever picked a dinky little... By, no, by this time, uh, <laughs> the Robin Hood uh, had broken through. Oh, uh, because, uh, do you remember uh, Teddy Roosevelt and the, uh, and the trust busters and all that stuff? Yeah. Okay. That, that whole uh, kind of populist movement that was going on to break up the, uh, you know, the government um, relationships with big business and stuff like that at all. So that kind of uh, removed a lot of the pressure. I get it. Okay? So Teddy and the mugwumps and all that kind of stuff, if you remember yeah. that. So by this time, nah, wasn't any problem. But Remington still had another trick up its sleeve. It wasn't done yet, but we'll get to that. So here's, uh, here's the cartridges right here. They called it the model 1860 Ball D is what the, uh, the French call it. So there they are right there. These are the ones with the Robin Hood head stamps on them. Oops, wrong way. I went all the way to the end again. <laughs> well, next time I'm bringing my own equipment. This is very embarrassing. So we'll page out, just, okay, you get to see everything again. Yeah, oh, there we are. Yeah, there it is, okay, there it is. Oh yeah, the Warriors. All right. Let me just get back, okay. The Remington. So, um, I need to cue myself on the date. Okay. Okay, well, this is a, uh, a picture that Ben Gravel took. Now, uh, he likes to, uh, or liked to say that this was the first area photograph ever taken uh, in Vermont. He uh, took it of oh, the Robin Hood. Um, I can't remember what the airplane was, but it was in 19, oh, I think uh, 1912, 1913, something like that. But this is when the plant was undergoing uh, a huge amount of expansion, okay? So if you compare it with the early one, uh, there's quite a bit of difference. Now this, see all these little mm -hmm. things right here? Uh, we'll get back into some explosions for you. Okay, this is where all the, uh, the powder was loaded into these. So how this thing worked, and this great big hopper of gunpowder, it came down uh, through this little uh, tube that was about an inch and a half in diameter made out of rubber. Okay, it went off to one side a little bit and then down into the loader. Now what happened is you had put the primer in the bottom of the cartridge. Okay, it would come on a, uh, on a conveyor, it would come across. 
and then the uh, the primer would be aiming up at the where the powder would be coming from, right? Uh, and then it was dropped in, the powder was put in, then it came down a little bit farther, and then it had the bullet that was put in it. These things right here, this was the place where they uh, did that. And every now and then what you had was a, what's called a high primer. And my grandfather told me uh, about this. And a high primer would come across and when they, when they would actually put this thing, this kind of centering thing down uh, that was attached to the rubber tube, okay, it would push on it and the primer would fire and it'd blow up. And every now and then, it was so designed uh, very elegantly that it wouldn't hurt anybody, but this thing would blow off and go up about 40 feet in the air. <laughs> Boom! Like that. And it, uh, he said it was a beautiful sight to see. Frank, that's an awful lot of buildings over there. Do you have uh, information as to what was in each one of the buildings? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I walked this with, uh, with Oren and Ben Gravel and Mr. Gagne. And I've got the graph. Uh, it's actually one of the pictures there. And then this is uh, and World War I insurance. Uh, the U.S. government, and, and they had to actually certify that this plant was safe. And so this has all the different activities that go on in all the different parts of the building. So that, they had to actually prove that, you know, there was a, we'll get into the, uh, the whole issue with sabotage and stuff like that. But they had to actually document Ron, do you have one of these too, and that has all the purpose of all the different rooms? No, I don't. Oh, okay. It's good to have connections, I guess, through your granddad. Just the Sanborn map of uh, 1909. Yep. All right, so this is what went on. Uh, huge expansion, obviously. Okay. Uh, they added a lot of new buildings. Put two new boilers on. They built a perimeter fence around, I, in 1968 when I did this research, I was able to find still pieces of the, of the old fence and there's still some here and there left. So it's be an interesting paper little chase to go try to find it. Uh, they built a block guard house, okay. Uh, they installed a rifle range and most interestingly they installed a Hotchkiss machine gun uh, range as well and they took a Hotchkiss machine gun and it was bolted down and they would uh, fire uh, something like oh I think it was uh, 4,000 rounds at a time just to see if any of them would uh, wouldn't work and jam up the, uh, the works of the Hotchkiss so that was really an interesting thing uh, there's a lot of interesting stories about uh, about that they have the kids come in, uh, put your earphones on. They actually had uh, earphones in those days, and all the kid had to do was just touch it and go, bam! And I could do that matraca again. No. <laughs> no? Isn't that aggravating? Okay. Um, and so that was uh, a lot of fun. Uh, so the rifle range. They weren't interested in hitting anything. They were just interested in certifying uh, that it would not come up the works of the machine gun. So that was really an important, uh, an important issue. Uh, the French sent over inspectors. Uh, there's, I've got some stories about the French, and more importantly, when we get international explosives, Ivan the Terrible. Okay, they, uh, the Russians had a contract, and they sent a Russian uh, over here to oversee everything, and he oversaw. Okay, uh, exploded up to a thousand people. And when you think about that, one, one employee uh, supports, uh, you know, in a family between three and six people. So you can imagine the population uh, explosion that happened. This is a time period uh, when they had the traction company that ran streetcars to St. Albans because Swanton couldn't handle the, uh, you know, the huge growth. So, what was the physical area of all of this plant? Uh, let's see. Um, basically... Um, it's where it is now. Well, okay. No, no, in terms of acreage, what would you say? I don't know. What is what would the modern acreage be? Not yeah, but, only my site is ten acres, but they've okay. taken. Okay. It was a lot bigger eight, than yes, that. That's right, but there was like nine or ten acres that the school got. And yeah. Other, and there's all and, kinds. Yeah. There's, there's so 30, 40 acres, easy. Yep. 
And remember, the Robin Hood, before it was bought by the Remington, retained the powder horn and uh, the Riverside structures as well. Okay. So it was a big deal. This is the 1969. This is a photograph of the fence. Uh, it's still there. I was able to get, get some interesting uh, oral history about that fence uh, from some uh, Abenaki colleagues of mine years ago. So here's the safety plan of the Remington. Uh, it was really important that, uh, that this would be managed properly because of the potential for sabotage during World War, World War I. And so uh, they had to prov provide this long document that I only have bits and pieces of. But basically, this shows where all the underground uh, water lines, everything had to have sprinklers. It had to have uh, perimeter fences. Um, and it had to document and justify everything um, in all of the different locations and show uh, that they were all safe. Okay, so it's very important. Uh, the buildings today are made out of uh, large, uh, large blocks of, uh, of stone, uh, except for this is where they loaded the, uh, the cartridges and things like that. These buildings here, they were expendable. So they were made out of, um, of just wood, okay? But uh, so if this burned down, there wouldn't be too much of a problem. But they still, they, you had to tell exactly where the, uh, where the on and off switches or the valves, I guess, uh, for, the, um, for the sprinklers and everything. So that's all on here. That's really interesting. Where would the guardhouse be? Right here. Yep. And that was manned 24 hours? Yep. It's still there today. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we were thinking about it years ago. I remember making a little museum there. Yes. Yep. Uh, Company B of the National Vermont National Guard, I guess it's a Swanton unit, was uh, assigned here and at the International Cartridge Company as well. So that was some of our first military action in Vermont of World War I. I'm not, this is my graph again uh, that I, I don't need to do again. This is the, an interesting gadget. Uh, this is the vacuum dryer. This is a 1969 shot of, uh, of this room. This is uh, a building that was designed specifically to explode. Uh, it had uh, demountable walls, and it was really fascinating uh, type of a structure. Does this still exist? This building? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, it's designed specifically uh, for. They had these big. Um, pumps, and uh, the idea was to uh, use uh, high pressure or high. What's the reverse of pressure? Vacuum, high something vacuum. Okay, to get the uh, all the water and some of the volatiles out of the chlorate of potash. Um, so, this was where they took the water out of the fulminate. That was something different from this. This is after all of that had been done. Okay. Okay. So this was specific, uh, Judd Hilliker uh, told me that this was designed to blow up. So I didn't know that the walls were two feet thick. So probably the walls were meant to stand and the roof would go up. <laughs> okay. It's really interesting that they had to actually construct things expecting them to blow. So you're getting enough explosions now? Isn't that interesting? Um, <clears throat> Okay, the interesting thing is, and I didn't know this until uh, fairly recently, is that um, starting in March 16, this says Robin Hood Ammunition Company, they, these were actually still made, uh, excuse me, these were made by Remington rather than uh, by Robin Hood. But they had to keep the RHA stamp on it because that's what the French contract said. And only later uh, when they, uh, they got their own contracts that they actually, uh, you know, they could start putting the Remington on it. And so these are the uh, examples made by U uh, Remington UMC. UMC is Union Metallic Cartridge Company. And so this is it. This is it. Um, 
4.17, April 17, this was the earliest uh, one when they finally decided to start using uh, Remington arms. Uh, they didn't use UMC, interestingly. So there's... Now, uh, this is a fascinating little document that my grandfather worked on, Houston, Texas. Um, I want to come back to this. You see it's dated here 1916, but this has some interesting uh, things that will come up in a little bit. There was a company uh, in Texas, and this is completely, how should I put this? Completely undocumented or undiscussed in the literature at all, and I really don't know where to go with it um, because it's the, the, you have to do your PhD dissertation on it. But this was probably four years uh, before the closing of the plant, but there was communications between my grandfather and people in Texas, and I'm going to tell you what happened after the closure of the Robin Hood plant. And this is a, uh, a really interesting, interesting document. So, January 1919, the Remington plant closed, mm. okay? And so, we know that because this is a letter of recommendation from my grandfather, written by the uh, Charles Bradley, the works manager at the Remington. So we got a good date on that. Um, and after that, in 1923, okay, uh, quite a few years after that, uh, a cartridge company in Texas came up by rail and they loaded uh, a huge selection of all the machinery in there, and it went down to Texas and was used down there. So I just was, I thought that was kind of interesting uh, that my granddad had this guy's name in the bank. So I think there were some, uh, some attempts to have the Texas uh, company buy out Robin Hood or something like that. So uh, it's really interesting, and I, you know, it's just a mystery. So this is telling us that just a few months after the end of World War One, it was all over. Yeah, they lost all their uh, all their contracts. No more hunters. <laughs> yep. So, oh, this is a reminder to do another reading. Should I do that? No, I won't. <laughs> okay, so this is the powder horn. Um, fulminate. So we've got to say goodbye to the powder horn. 1921. The powder horn didn't fare much better than another explosion I'm going to tell you about in a minute. It was destroyed in 1921 when men removing a bin of chlorate of potash bumped it on a doorway. This is another part of the ammunition complex that was noisily eliminated. Now, Judd Hilliker, now he was a gentleman that was somewhat given to hyperbole. Um, he said that he uh, talked to a gentleman that was in that explosion, and he said it blew him so high in the air uh, that he could see Lake Champlain. <laughs> now, if you've ever been to where the powder horn is, uh, it's on the McQuam Road uh, off to the right. Okay, you'd have to be blown about 40 feet in the air to be able to see that. So uh, that's another uh, old-timer story, okay? So if he got blown so high, I don't know what shape he was in. But the weird thing is that, uh, remember when Judd was talking about it, it felt like a big hand. Mm -hmm. So the shock wave, uh, if you didn't get pieces of the building that would go through you, now apparently the shock wave would just uh, of fulminate was a slightly different than, say, you know, like most modern explosions. It was, uh, it produced a pressure wave that was probably that wide rather than that wide. So it really, whoop, you know, just rather than broke all your bones and then shattered you and threw you away. So it's really interesting. Yes? Did he have a lot of lives lost or is there a record of it? Um, I have got no record of anybody at the Robin Hood uh, or at the Remington that lost their lives. Uh, just about everybody that worked in the uh, had broken limbs and things like that. Back in those days, yeah, 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 it's broken. Go back to work. Okay. <laughs> Uh, but I don't have any record of anybody dying there. Now we're going to get to another company that had some deaths. Let's see if we can start from the current slide. What do you think? Nope. 
Okay. Nothing like trying to do page down, which is right next to end in the dark. <laughs> Want to see the picture? Oh, that, aren't they nice? Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Nice. Yeah, yeah, okay, there we go. Oh, there we are. Oop. Wow, there's my granddad. Boom. The interesting cartridges. Yeah, yeah, yeah. More cartridges. There we are. Oh, boxes, metallic. There we go. Good review, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would love to have one of those. <clears throat> Maybe I will, just for... I had one. Lost it. Oh well. Another story. Fred, the presentation dominates any technical difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> Better watch out, I'll do the matraca again. Please <laughs> don't. Okay, we're getting closer, getting closer. Oh, there we are. Okay. International Explosive Company. All right, now, when uh, the Remington bought out Robin Hood, um, all it wanted was the new plant because the new plant was safe. Okay, it was up to whatever, you know, hideously antiquated standards uh, were operational then. Uh, the old building uh, and the powder horn were not. Okay, page down. Okay, so. International Explosive Company, 1915 to 1918, uh, they retained the Riverside and the Powder Horn. Okay, the old two original buildings. Now, they received a Russian government contract. Uh, it was for primers, okay, just the same kind that we're always familiar with, but also cannon cartridge exploders. That's a name for a, uh, a primer that's that big. Okay, think about the amount of fulminate and chlorate of potash you've got to put in those things. So here was um, the Remington. Their primers were shipped up from, uh, from uh, Bridgeport and um, starts with the E in New York. I can't remember the place. Um, okay, so they, were a, they didn't have to worry about that at all. Okay, that was left up to Remington. So no more big booms except for high primer, like that. But now the International Explosives, they had a 1898 powder horn with the equipment. Very, very antiquated. And they also had that big wooden building right over the water. Also very antiquated. So now uh, that was a disaster just waiting to happen. Now, with the uh, government, Russian government contract, uh, the Russian government sent over um, a inspector to make sure that everything was done. And uh, some of the old timers, when I was a kid, have stories about Ivan the Terrible. Okay, I don't know whether it was actually his name, uh, but room, you know, the way that people had described him was huge, big Stalinesque mustache, uh, big Cossack boots and stuff like that, and he'd stride around the building, and everybody was afraid of him, okay? So these are some of the stories, you know, that, uh, uh, that were around when I was a kid. So I, I kind of had, uh, you know, an image of this guy with a big Cossack hat, you know, and the stuff like that. And uh, so Ivan the inspector, uh, they employed 100 people, okay? So uh, they were doing about one-tenth that the Remington and later Robin Hood were, but it was still, this would support three to maybe 500 people in town. So this was a very significant employer, okay? And so what they did is they manufactured and uh, the, or mixed the uh, chlorate of potash and the fulminate, and they had to take ground glass. And they actually ground the glass with it to put these all together. Uh, and then back in the Riverside building, the one next to the, I wonder if I got a picture of it. Page down. Yeah, okay, here we go. Uh, so this is where they had uh, all the, uh, the equipment to punch out the, the, the brass for the primers and the exploders. Then they, uh, they would send these over uh, to the powder horn uh, to be uh, mixed. Then they had to come back and the uh, the primers had to have a piece of, um, of foil, I believe it was tin, that had to be very carefully put in the top of, of that and then seal with some lacquer to keep the moisture out. Remember what happens if the moisture gets in there? All right, so they ended up 
with uh, a whole bunch of primers in this wooden building. Okay, and uh, everybody else was, previously had had all the primers and the priming equipment out in these little tiny buildings like that one that I show you that blew up. Mm -hmm. Okay, but they didn't do that here. Okay, because they only had the powder horn that had small buildings, and I don't understand exactly the, uh, you know, the reasons for that. But basically, there was a huge amount of these things. Um, these primers and the larger, uh, you know, the big cannon primers uh, there as well. And so on March 17th, 1917, um, it had its first major explosion. This was in the back of the building. St. Patrick's Day. Pardon? St. Patrick's Day. Okay. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And uh, E.M. Funk, he was the works manager uh, there, was killed, along with uh, Nellie Hemingway and Dora Savage. Um, Dora is a relative of mine, uh, I think a third cousin. Who is that picture? Right over there. Okay, yeah. That's her. Oh. Excellent. And yeah, we actually use this information here. Uh, for the application for uh, state recognition uh, by the Abenakis, uh, because a lot of the people that worked at these plants were uh, local indigenous people. So it's kind of an interesting story. So this was, uh, this was in the back of the plant, uh, and it pretty well, it demolished a, a fairly large area, but it was nothing like the next one, just a year later, uh, March 28th. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any names uh, for these two unnamed inspectors, and this took the plant out completely. Uh, my, uh, let's say, it wasn't Judd, I can't remember who said, but uh, it set up some kind of resonance uh, with the explosion that set off uh, the primers uh, all down the line. Mm -hmm. It just went, whoom, and went through, and it, uh, it apparently destroyed most of the plant, so much so that it was unable to be rebuilt. Because look at the time, 1918, we're at the end of the war. Yeah. Okay? So it wasn't worth their while at they all. No, didn't they? No. <laughs> okay? So that's the reason, um, so that was the end of International Explosive Company. And the reason for that was they were using outdated equipment in outdated structures and, and things. So, uh, you know, they didn't, that's why I don't think Robin Hood had too much trouble, uh, and certainly Remington didn't, because they had to, they had the big government contracts, uh, and they had to have all the inspectors, and, uh, insurance, and all kinds of, you know, bureaucratic red tape. I don't, uh, you know, it's, it's really too bad that, um, you know, these were uh, eliminated. Side light there is that the building itself on the riverside at that time was owned by Barney Marmot. Uh, my records say it was sh it was sold to them immediately after. But the Remington equipment was installed in the Barney Marble building. Okay. Because there was a big difference in the amount of insurance involved for recovery by the two parties. Okay. Because I've got some documents that said it was sold right after this. The remains were sold to the uh, the uh, to the Barney Marble. So. It could be. Yep. And what happened to the other plane? Excuse me? What happened to the Robin Hood plane? Uh, the, okay, I can tell, tell you about that because that's family history. Uh, the Robin Hood also closed down. Um, on, here's my letter from my, my grandfather, January 8th, 1919 is when they shut the plant down. That's, when my, that's my grandfather's letter of recommendation from the head of the, uh, of the factory. Um, and so they basically shut it all down. Uh, remember I told you that in 1923, uh, a company in Texas came and got a lot of the stuff. But my grandfather was hired by Remington uh, from the closing of the plant to 1929. And he was the, uh, the guardian and the keeper of the building until it was sold by the Cataract Company. And so my granddad was the last um, you know, Remington employee and uh, he would have to go over every day and walk it, uh, inspect it, and fill out reports and stuff like that. And uh, so it was sold. Uh, 
and then it went through a whole series of uh, you know other other sales. But uh, today it's uh, you know a wonderful memory, a wonderful reminder of uh, the good old days in Swanton, and it's a bit of family as well as uh, community history. So thank you. So if you want, uh, there's some of my documents. There's.